Yeah, here we are in the Sawtooth Solar Project. 10,000 acres, which is 16 square miles. I mean, that's larger than a lot of cities. We think this project would take out about 70,000 of these Joshua trees. If we get these transmission lines built here, it could be that every basin from Las Vegas to Reno will be filled with industrial utility scale solar, removing huge ecosystems. It would be a catastrophe for biodiversity. So far, we've been to the Pahrump Valley and up to Tonopah to show you areas threatened by massive industrial solar projects. Today, we're near Beatty, Nevada, directly adjacent Death Valley National Park, to show you a 16 square mile area that will be paid for yet another industrial energy project. This project alone threatens 70,000 Joshua trees and countless other plants and animals that make up our Mojave ecosystem. And that's the thing, this isn't just about one place. We are bringing light to the fact that the current plan endorsed by our political leaders includes a giveaway of 9 million acres of public lands in Nevada to these solar companies, right in the middle of what scientists are calling the sixth mass extinction. This is about a desert apocalypse. Yeah, here we are in Nevada's outback. I mean, this vast public lands, home of Paiute and Shoshone, and managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And I'm up here on this hill because this is a great place to see the Sawtooth Solar Project proposal. Here's a map showing this gigantic solar project. We're right here on this little hill looking out to this 10,000 acre Sawtooth Energy Center application area in Sarcobatis Flat. It's so vast here that I'm going to have to explain it by kind of panning. It's 10,000 acres, which is 16 square miles. I mean, that's larger than a lot of cities. But if you look over there, that's the Grapevine Mountains forested with pinyon and juniper in Death Valley National Park. And there's a, a little road right along the Nevada Triangle, which is the Nevada portion of the park. And so the project starts from there and would cover this entire basin all the way to that triangular dark hill with the sand blow-ups. That would be one corner. And then the other corner would be that little round brown hill. That's how vast the solar project would be. It would completely obliterate this remote basin and cover it with photovoltaic solar panels, which could easily go on rooftops instead. Brown fields, um, old mining sites, there's plenty of mining sites around here. But um, for some reason, the project developer wanted to pick one of the wildest and most remote deserts, um, transitioning from the Mojave Desert to the Great Basin. Well, this is the boundary of Death Valley National Park. This is known as the Nevada Triangle. We're here because the Sawtooth Solar Project would be right on the border of this. Over this way behind me, we're looking at the Grapevine Mountains. Um, Grapevine Peak is almost 9,000 feet. It's a sky island. It has limber pine on the top, um, and it's a very beautiful, isolated section, maybe one of the most remote parts of our national parks here in the lower 48 United States. A solar project would probably bring in a proliferation of invasive weeds that would probably fill up the basins here within the park lands. And those can actually cause fires. Um, it does happen out here in the desert. People who look at this landscape don't think it can burn, but 
These new catastrophic fires seem to be hotter and they're windier than other fires and they have taken out Joshua Tree Forest. All we need is a giant solar project to disturb the land adjacent to the park. Those weeds will move in and you've got a lot more fuel um, threatening the, the park here. If they were to build a solar project next to this area, it will damage this national park for the worse for many, many years. It's just not a good idea. The rest of the desert, it's a really diverse transition scrub desert. It's higher than the Mojave Desert and it's lower than the sagebrush steppe. So, I mean, a lot of the plants uh, we, we have right here, this is Mormon tea. It, it's Nevada ephedra. That's a very common plant growing here. Um, this is wolfberry and it's very dry right now, but it will have orange berries that the Paiute and Shoshone would um, harvest in the spring. I mean, it's drought ridden now, but huge diversity of other shrubs like winter fat. We have Mojave asters, um, shad scale, salt bush, and it just you walk out there and there are flocks of horned larks will fly up. And as I said in the spring, I mean, this area will be just covered with desert dandelions, desert pincushion flowers. So if this were a, a rainy, cool winter, we'd be striding amongst wildflowers right now. Populations of pronghorn antelope, and we've even found a fawning ground on the other side of this basin. And ironically, the the Green Link West transmission line is proposed to go slashing right through that antelope fawning ground. But the sheer size of this solar project will block connectivity for species like pronghorn antelope. Um, there are small pockets of Mojave Desert tortoise that go a little bit up into these hills, so they are here. They're not, this is the northern edge of their range but they will be blocked. And if we have a need for, you know, climate change causes a northward migration, I shouldn't say migration, but a northward, you know, need for habitat, this will block that. I mean, it's so large, it will just completely block this valley almost from that mountain range to that mountain range. you can see scattered throughout this basin are the western Joshua tree, which is the same Joshua tree in the California Mojave Desert, West Mojave, that recently got protected under the California Endangered Species Act. But when it comes here into Nevada, it gets no protection. So the solar developer will probably have to just bulldoze down all of those Joshua trees. There's too many to translocate, so they've stopped trying to replant them. So a lot of those will just get killed. Okay, so I'm standing right here next to a, a fairly old Western Joshua tree, a Yucca brevifolia. It's actually, a, looks to me like it's, I don't, I can't tell the exact age. It must be over a hundred years old. Um, and this is a fairly large Joshua tree forest. I was saying before that this is one of the more extensive Joshua tree forests in the north area, north area of the Death Valley region. And in fact, it defines the, the northern boundary of the Mojave Desert. National groups are trying to put this species on the national endangered species list. And they're essentially doing that based on climate change. And um, this could very well in the future end up being a refugia for the species. And um, it seems ironic to us that Next Era Energy would want to put a sprawling solar project on 15 square miles, spanning out and pretty much taking out all the Joshua trees that you can see behind me. Think about that. We took a look at this site, we took a walk on it, 
And we estimated the Joshua trees are probably 25 to 30 per acre. And then we did a little bit of math. This might be give or take a few. It might not be completely accurate, but we think this project would take out about 70,000 of these Joshua trees. That's a hell of a lot of Joshua trees. It's very difficult to move these. And it would also be very, very expensive to move 70,000 Joshua trees. So what are they going to do? It's called mastication. They get these little bulldozers and they have these shredders on the end of them. And they basically turn these into mulch. Think about it, it's like, what, 150-year-old tree here just turned into a pile of sawdust, basically, so they can replace it with rooftop-compatible solar panels. Yeah, that really pisses us off. We think that's a big waste of habitat, and we're really sad to see that um, it's come to this to where our federal government is actually considering it, allowing this to happen. And I guess the only reason we haven't had them here is there's no transmission lines. So that's a big push now, is to get high voltage, long transmission lines coming down from Reno and connecting to Las Vegas. And one would come right along the side of this basin and just basically open it up for renewable energy development. Um, in a, a place that's truly remarkably remote, a buffer to Death Valley National Park. Yeah, I mean, we're if we get these transmission lines built here, it could be that every basin from Las Vegas to Reno will be filled with industrial utility scale solar projects in areas where um, large scale solar projects have really been built up, like Chuckwalla Valley along the I-10 in California, in the California desert, from Palm Springs to Blythe, you regularly still have dust plumes coming off of the scraped land underneath the solar projects. And, you know, this leads to um, the, the project developer putting down dust suppressants, which are often full of pretty nasty chemicals, even like fossil fuel derivatives. And what's that going to do for the desert? That even kills more of the seed base and the wildflowers to put dust palliatives down. I mean, all, all the developers are looking for is flat and sunny. They are, they're not looking at biodiversity. They're not looking at all the carbon sequestration from, I mean, we've seen biological soil crusts. They're dormant in the drought, but there are mosses, lichens, um, cyanobacteria crusts that go down into the soil here and store carbon. So when we bulldoze that desert up, we'll actually be releasing carbon into the atmosphere. So we're just really cumulatively looking at removing huge ecosystems and remote public lands um, for energy that should be, again, going in cities. I mean, that we should be putting all these solar panels in the load centers, the cities, on rooftops, on warehouses, on carports. And despite what the naysayers say, there's plenty of space to generate this amount of megawatts. Renewable energy sources like solar power are seen as a way to address climate change, but where should solar arrays go? And what impact are giant solar farms having on Nevada's ecosystems? There's all sorts of mapping and tools available for policymakers to understand where a sensitive species habitat is and where that does and doesn't overlap with potential sites for solar renewable development. We are, in addition to being in a climate crisis, also in a biodiversity crisis. Not only do we have just a, as humans, responsibility to consider biodiversity in the planning process, there, there is a federal law, the Endangered Species Act, that requires it. Well, we are in a global extinction crisis. There are species going extinct literally every day around the world. 
And, uh, you know, I sometimes call Nevada the front lines of the extinction crisis mm. because we have so many rare species that live across this state and we also have a lot of industry that, that threatens those species. And, you know, biodiversity, the assemblage of all the species on Earth, that's what makes life on Earth possible. That's why you and I and the human race is here because uh, uh, biodiversity puts food on our plates and gives us clean air to breathe and clean water to drink. Mm. The extinction crisis threatens life on Earth. You know, I think it depends on what our priorities are. Uh, if our priority is decarbonization, uh, uh, cleaning up our energy economy as fast as possible, we could do that on people's rooftops. Uh, we have incredible amounts of rooftop space here in Southern Nevada, and uh, if, if our priority was to make that happen in as democratized a way as possible, we could have rooftops on every, uh, solar panels on every rooftop in Southern Nevada. However, you know, our current mode of energy production, the priority is generating returns for shareholders. NV Energy is a for-profit corporation and they're looking to make a buck. And they don't make a buck when solar's on your rooftop. We are happy to see this conversation happening in Nevada. There are a lot of questions about building up a new energy infrastructure. There's the mining explosion for lithium and cobalt, copper, and many other minerals that require destructive, pollution-heavy extraction methods. Will we outlaw fossil fuels in the process? Or how do we know solar and other forms of energy will actually re replace fossil fuels? Will industry realistically be able to use renewable energy instead of diesel? Or does the climate and biodiversity crisis require a deeper transformation of our society? We are asking these tough questions because the status quo just isn't acceptable. If humans are to survive the century, we will once again need to utilize our ability to adapt and change. That's something we can do if we are determined to fight for life on this planet. Thanks for being part of this discussion. There is plenty more to talk about. Join us next time as we visit another area east of Beatty, near Death Valley and the ghost town of Rhyolite, where more solar projects threaten biodiversity and the national park. We'll see you then. Where did all the blue skies go? Poison is the wind that blows from the north and south and east. Oh, mercy, mercy me. Oh, things ain't what they used to be. No, no. Oil oh, wasted on the ocean and upon our seas. Fish full of mercury. Oh, 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 mercy, mercy me, yeah. Oh, things ain't what they used to be, no, no. Radiation underground and in the sky. Animals and birds that live nearby die. Oh, mercy, mercy me, yeah. Oh, things ain't what Crowded, how much more abuse from man can she stand?